Welcome to the MSME Radio Network. The broadcast shows are for informational and entertainment purposes only. They are not designed to provide listeners with specific personal, medical, or counseling advice. Individuals with a medical issue should always consult their health care provider. MSME is not responsible for content of individual shows. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own. Enjoy the show. I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's January 22nd, and we have a lot to talk about. I received an email from a member of the Real Talk MS listener community, and Chris asked if we could talk about choosing the best MS medication. There are two different schools of thought when it comes to prescribing MS disease-modifying therapy, the induction therapy model and the escalation therapy model represent very different approaches to choosing the best MS medication for you. My guest is Dr. Aaron Boster, the System Medical Chief for Neuroimmunology at Ohio Health. And today, Dr. Boster is going to explain the difference between these two competing schools of thought. And most importantly, Dr. Boster and I are going to talk about an important conversation that you should be having with your neurologist in determining the best MS treatment for you. But before we get to my conversation with Dr. Boster, there are a few other things that you should know about. Last summer, in our podcast episode about stem cell therapy for MS, I told you about a clinical trial that was in progress. The trial was being conducted by Dr. Richard Burt, the chief of the Division of Immunotherapy at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. In that podcast episode, I was able to share some of the interim results from this study that was still in progress at the time, and last week, Dr. Burt published the results of this clinical trial, and the results are encouraging. Now, this study involved 110 participants with relapsing remitting MS. Half of the participants received HSCT, or hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and the other half stayed on their MS disease-modifying drug therapy. The study participants who received HSCT were given non-ablative treatment. That is, their immune systems were knocked down, but not completely deleted before they received the stem cell transplant. And as I just mentioned, the results of this study are encouraging. Of the 110 study participants... 103 stayed in the clinical trial to the end, and of the group that received HSCT, three of the participants experienced disease progression. In the group that stayed on disease-modifying therapy, 34 participants experienced disease progression. After one year, the group that received HSCT showed some improvement in their level of disability while the group that stayed on disease-modifying therapy saw their level of disability worsen a bit. Now, keep in mind that this is a small study, and Dr. Burt and his team are continuing their research, hoping to better understand who will best benefit from HSCT. Research to date indicates that the strongest candidate for HSCT is someone who's 50 years old or younger, has had MS for five years or less, has active relapsing remitting MS but is still walking, and who isn't responding well to the available disease-modifying therapies. So at this point, additional research still needs to be done. And as I mentioned to you last July when I shared the interim progress of this clinical trial, you can be sure that I'll keep you updated on the work being done to move stem cell therapy forward as a safe and effective treatment for multiple sclerosis. Now, if you'd like to drill down to more of the details in this study, you'll find a link to the study in today's show notes. Depression, anxiety, fatigue, and sleep problems can all have an impact on someone's quality of life. And unfortunately, each of these 
is a condition frequently reported by people who are living with MS. Mindfulness, or mindful meditation, has long been associated with improving quality of life and overall well-being. So a research team conducted a small study to determine whether mindfulness could be effective in improving well-being for people living with MS. The team recruited 156 people with MS who were evaluated for depression, anxiety, fatigue, sleep problems, and their overall quality of life. Then half of the study participants were given one of two different online mindfulness-based stress reduction interventions. All of the study participants were assessed after two months and again after six months. Now, these assessments included evaluations for depression, anxiety, fatigue, sleep problems, and overall quality of life. And the study results indicate that regardless of which mindfulness intervention was administered, the study participants who received the mindfulness intervention demonstrated an improved quality of life, lower anxiety, depression, and a lessening of their sleep problems. Mindfulness is affordable. It's easy to access and it's easy to do, which makes this very encouraging news of a non-pharmaceutical treatment for people living with MS who may be experiencing depression, anxiety, fatigue, and sleep problems. I'll include a link to the study in today's show notes. A research team in Greece wanted to determine whether stress, depression, and fatigue among MS caregivers had an impact on their overall physical and mental health status. The team collected data from 131 MS caregivers. They used a series of well-accepted surveys to measure and quantify fatigue, depression, caregiver stress, and overall health. And then they used sophisticated mathematical regression models to analyze that data. The research team concluded that fatigue, stress, and depression among MS caregivers correlates to a worsening of both their physical and mental health status, which seems a bit like concluding that the sun rises in the east. But now I suppose it can be scientifically declared to be true. If you'd like to review the study, I'll include a link in today's show notes. Each year, the National MS Society awards the Baransic Prize in recognition of exceptional innovation and originality in scientific research relevant to multiple sclerosis, with an emphasis on impact and potential of the research to lead to pathways for the treatment and cure for MS and scientific accomplishments that merit recognition as a future leader in MS research. Last week, the MS Society announced that this year's Baransic Prize is being awarded to Professor Katrina Akazoglu, a leading researcher at the Gladstone Institutes and the Department of Neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. If you're a regular Real Talk MS listener, you might remember that last October, I told you that the National MS Society had invested $300,000 in furthering Professor Akazoglu's research aimed at developing an antibody that could be a potential treatment to protect the nervous system from damage due to multiple sclerosis. Professor Akasaglu and her colleagues have shown that a blood clotting factor called fibrin is deposited in the brain during the immune attack in mouse models of MS. And this fibrin directly activates the microglia, the immune cells in the brain. So Dr. Akasaglu's antibody inhibits fibrin, decreasing the activation of microglia, which reduces the damage to nerve fibers in mice. And this antibody doesn't appear to interfere with fibrin's important blood clotting functions. Professor Akazoglu and her colleagues are now set upon humanizing this antibody for testing in a human population with MS. Professor Akazoglu will receive the Baransic Prize and deliver the prize lecture at the Akrams Forum, an MS research conference in late February in Dallas. If you're someone who's living with secondary progressive MS, 
we need your help. And if you know someone who's living with secondary progressive MS, we need their help. The Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, or ICER, is an organization that conducts clinical and cost-effectiveness analyses of new medicines. ICER is currently conducting a review of disease-modifying therapies for secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Now, insurers may use ICER recommendations to develop or change their approved drug lists, which could potentially improve or restrict access to MS medications for people living with MS. Well, to ensure that people living with MS have direct input into their analysis of the use and effectiveness of disease-modifying therapies, the MS Coalition contacted ICER, and as a result of their discussions, a survey has been developed to enable input from people who are living with secondary progressive MS. Your input is important so that the results of ICER's analysis can be viewed along with an understanding of your real-world experiences. But this online survey is only active through next Monday, January 28th. The survey is completely anonymous and, of course, voluntary. But if you're living with secondary progressive MS, I urge you to take a few minutes and provide some very important input and perspective to ICER's analysis by completing this survey. You'll find a link to the survey in today's show notes, and if the podcast app that you might be using doesn't show these links as live and clickable, please visit realtalkms.com, where you'll always find full show notes with usable, clickable links. When it comes to being the captain of your MS treatment, it's not just your experiences that count. It's your life goals, and factoring those goals into your treatment decisions is just one important factor that sometimes goes missing. In a moment, I'll be joined by my guest, Dr. Aaron Boster, and we're going to have a really important conversation of some of the things you need to know and some of the things you need to say to your neurologist when it comes to making an informed decision about your MS disease-modifying therapy. We've talked before about the importance of starting disease-modifying therapy once you've been diagnosed with MS, but there's a bit of a debate in the medical community about how you should start disease-modifying therapy. There are two different schools of thought, and to help us better understand the distinctions between the induction therapy model and the escalation therapy model is my guest, Dr. Aaron Boster, the System Medical Chief for Neuroimmunology at Ohio Health. Dr. Boster, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be back, John. Well, I think the best place to start our conversation is with a couple of definitions. Can can you explain what the induction and escalation therapy models are? Absolutely, with pleasure. Uh, if I start by taking, in fact, one small step back, um, the way that we apply medicines to a chronic condition um, isn't always cookie-cutter. And what I mean by that is when you have a chronic illness such as multiple sclerosis, it's likely that the therapy you start on might not be the last therapy you ever take. And when you have a condition for 40, 50 years, there's a possibility that you may in fact be on multiple different agents over the course of that time frame. And so there's actually a couple of different styles or approaches to how you deal with that. And the, the most common style used in the United States is this concept of escalation. So if we apply a definition, an escalation model would be to apply a medicine that might be mild to moderately effective in groups of people compared to other medicines, but might have a very lovely side effect profile. So you can imagine a drug that's not a gangbusters drug, but it's really, really safe. And the theory with the escalation model is if we start you on that drug and you respond, well, then we hit the risk-benefit balance possible. However, if you have breakthrough disease on that medicine, we will then escalate to thing that might work better, but it might have a slightly less favorable side effect profile. Again, we achieve disease stability. We finally hit the right balance of risk-benefit. And it can continue. So if you break through that disease-modifying therapy, again, there may be a call to escalate 
to a third agent that is maybe more effective and yet has a worse side effect profile. And the theory of escalation is to, to provide the, the, the right balance, so to speak. Now, th- that's, that is the most commonly used approach when treating people with MS. Can you talk a little bit about what, what is meant by induction therapy? Absolutely. Now, induction therapy is really a term born out of a different medical literature, out of oncology or treating cancer. And the concept here is, is really kind of the opposite of escalation. The theory is we're going to hit the disease up front as early as possible, as hard as possible, using the most effective therapies available, even if they have a higher risk profile, with hopes of wrangling the disease to the ground in, in kind of setting the stage for an easier time uh, in, in the future. So you take the risk up front, but the benefit might kind of reset the clock or reboot, um, the, the, in this case, the immune response. So in, in essence, induction therapy is kind of the opposite of escalation. And this is very common. I'll give you uh, an example in cancer. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma used to carry a 95% uh, death rate at five years, a pretty grim statistic. And now it carries a 95% survival rate at five years. The change was the adoption of escalation, uh, excuse me, of induction therapy, where someone newly diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is given not three, not four, but five simultaneous chemotherapeutic agents called RCHOP. It's very, um, the term we use is it's very morbid. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of side effects. It's a very challenging therapy, but it sets the stage in, in such a way that then we can oftentimes achieve excellent disease control. And so you can sort of see, I hope, how the escalation and the induction model are sort of uh, different approaches to how you're going to manage the disease long term. Who determines which of these models, or, or I guess you could even call them treatment philosophies, uh, to follow? And, and how was that determination made? It's really fascinating, John. This is, this is not something that we're traditionally taught in medical school at all. In medical school and even in residency training, physicians learn how drugs work. They learn the, the ins and outs of the metabolism of the drugs and how they interact with other drugs and so on and so forth. But the big picture is not something that they're traditionally taught. And, and as you point out, these treatment philosophies are not part of formal medical education. The, the individual trainee might learn a particular style from their mentor, uh, kind of like an apprenticeship. So uh, when, when someone is doing a residency in neurology and they're, they're training under the supervision of an attending physician, they'll oftentimes learn to mirror the style of that physician. Uh, similarly, uh, people that go on to do advanced training, fellowship training, um, uh, again, will learn the style of their mentor. You know, there's a saying in MS neurology, if you tell me who trained you, I'll tell you how you treat. Because it's very common that you can see almost camps where um, a large center who, who produces a lot of fantastic trainees who go out into the field and practice all tend to have a similar style. The, the issue that I have is that it's not, it's not discussed enough. It's, it's not on the forefront, and it's not discussed amongst physicians enough And it's really, to my chagrin, not conveyed to patients. This is information, in my opinion, that a patient and a family needs to understand so they understand how that clinician hopes to address their disease. I couldn't agree with you more. I've often talked on the podcast about my hope that people living with MS consider themselves medical consumers. And they spend a little bit of time doing some of the homework, at least as much homework as you might spend on planning your next vacation in terms yep. of understanding the course of their treatment. And it sounds like in this case, uh, determining the therapy model to be used, the treatment philosophy to follow, it really isn't patient specific. It's, it's not a case of where a treating physician is saying patient A should be treated uh, through the uh, escalation therapy model, but patient B will do will, will be more successful in their treatment in the induction model. It, it sounds like it's it's 
doctor specific in terms of which path to take. And that doctor is going to choose that path most, if not all of the time. You're absolutely right. And I share your opinion. Uh, you know, this is a, a disease that, in my opinion, has to be dealt with, uh, with a team. And the center of that team is the patient and the family. And so it's my hope that, you know, learning, um, for example, listening to this podcast energizes patients and families to ask provocative questions. Hey, doc, what's your treatment philosophy? What's your treatment style? Um, so that they can engage in a meaningful conversation and walk away feeling aligned that, hey, this is how I want to approach it. You know, it's interesting. I don't use a traditional escalation or an induction model. But my own personal treatment style is, is, is slightly different. And if you let me, I'd like to share it with you just briefly. Sure. Um, the reason that, so this makes a lot of sense to me, and it seems to work well with my patients. And I'd like to get your impressions. What I do when I meet a family, you know, first we spend a good hour, hour and a half talking about their disease, clarifying the diagnosis, doing a proper neurological examination, looking at all the imaging, et cetera. When we get to the part where we confirm, yep, this is MS, we then talk about the prognostic factors, the, the, the facts that predispose this particular human to either have a more rapid or more benign disease course. And then I go to my whiteboard. I have a whiteboard in every clinic room. And I write up the top four medicines that they're eligible for in the order of efficacy per Aaron's opinion. So th that those list of four drugs might be different for one person to another based on the specifics of that human and their comorbid conditions, et cetera. And I tell them, I'm going to talk to you about the most effective drug on the board, the top drug on the board. I'm going to share the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we're going to discuss it. And if you agree to take that drug, that's what we're going to take because I want you on the most effective drug you're comfortable with. But if you instead say, Doc, I'm really not comfortable with that drug, then what we'll do instead is I will downgrade to the second best drug, per, per my opinion, on that list. And I'll then proceed to talk to you about the good, the bad, and the ugly of that second drug. And if you agree to that drug, we'll take that. And if you don't, then we'll downgrade to it. And the reason I do this is I want to A, stress the importance of efficacy, but B, I have to find the sweet spot between my desire to get you on the most efficacious drug possible and your own personal risk aversion. And so this process feels much more organic to me and where we end up is rather unique. It's, it's between, you know, you and me that day for you at that time. And what we determine might be the best fit for you might be completely different than the next person I see in clinic. Well, you said uh, at the beginning of this explanation that you wanted to get my take on that. And it, it, my take is that is wonderful. That is extraordinary in terms of what too many patients uh, living with MS tend to see when they have that visit. It's, it's not always quite as complete. In fact, I think the first thing you said is on that uh, initial visit, I'm going to spend an hour to an hour and a half. Well, I think a whole lot of people listening to this podcast just looked up and said, huh? <laughs> because they perhaps have not seen their neurologist for a total of an hour or an hour and a half in, in, in the course of their treatment. So you started off you know, with ex extraordinary and you got better. <laughs> oh, well, you know, you, you honor me and I'm grateful. And it's, it's my biased opinion that in order to truly understand, it, it takes a very special thing, time. And, you know, in, in the modern era, 2019, doctors aren't afforded a lot of time. And that's too bad for us. So we have to accommodate because I don't know how on earth I can learn about a human being and the intricacies of their own unique neuroimmunologic condition unless we take the time to listen. You know, I teach my trainees, if you listen to the human being, 90% of the time, they'll give you the answer. You just have to be patient. Since you mentioned listening, brings me to the logical question, I think, given this conversation that we're having today, what is the conversation that someone living with MS should be initiating with their neurologist? I think that 
the person living with MS has to share a couple things. Number one, life goals. I ask my patients and their families to contemplate and to tell me their life goals. I'm not talking, John, about MS goals. I'm talking about life goals, like I want to climb Machu Picchu, or I want to stand at my son's graduation, or I want to walk my daughter down the aisle on her wedding night, or I want to finish my PhD. You know, so the first thing we have to do is we have to clarify life goals because we're not taking MS therapy because it's enjoyable. We're taking MS therapy in essence to achieve those life goals so that MS doesn't get in the way. And I think that if the patient, the family and the doc are aligned about the life goals, it helps ready set what we're trying to accomplish. So, so that's the first piece. The second piece is I think that the, the, the person or the family with MS has to express to the best of their ability, their risk aversion. You know, when you go to see a financial planner, the first thing that person tries to do is figure out how risky do you want to be with your cash? And, and the way that they invest your money is rather different if you tend to be a bit more skittish or nervous about losing money. But if you don't mind, you might, you might see that financial planner be much more aggressive in the markets. And I think that in a similar fashion, the MS neurologist has to learn from the patient and family, what's your risk aversion? I have some patients that very clearly state, Dr. B, I don't want any risk. I want you to give me a drug that is zero risk. I have other patients that make you know, the opposite statement, say, hit me, go ahead, hit me hard, I can handle it. And learning their perspective is critically important because if you have those pieces of information, now I think you've charged the neurologist with the, the, the appropriate information to help guide that person and that family. I, I think that the conversation we've just had today is going to give birth to many, many, many conversations that people are going to be having with their neurologist to, to uh, remind them that the, the patient themselves is a part of the equation when it comes to treatment. And there are different therapy models that relate to your comfort zone when it comes to risk. And, and as people living with MS share that information, I think it, it kind of almost forces a response from their neurologist. So the next thing you know, we have everybody involved in, in a treatment plan. And I think that's healthier than what too many people have to face today. I, I completely agree with you. And, and just to highlight one point, it's been my experience that doctors oftentimes misjudge the risk aversion of, of a given person with MS. I've heard numerous doctors say, well, I don't use drug X because my patients are scared of it. And what I think they're actually saying is, I don't use drug X because I'm scared of it. And when you actually talk to the human being, more often than not, I find that the individual's risk aversion, when placed in the proper context of the risk of the disease, is a lot lower than the clinician initially thought. And hence, hence uh, the, the strong desire to help the patient, family, and the clinician engage in that meaningful conversation so you can realize where they, they land. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. Well, again, I think this has been an incredibly meaningful conversation, and I just appreciate giving of your time and expertise to really uh, shed shed some light on a very, very important topic. And, and as I said, hopefully generate a whole bunch more conversations between people living with MS and their neurologist. Uh, Dr. Boster, thanks again for talking with me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you, John. Have a great one. Well, that's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Just a reminder that today's conversation with Dr. Boster, which I think was incredibly important, well, it was all prompted by one of our listeners' suggestions. Your feedback, your questions, and suggestions for future podcast episodes are important to me. That's why, in addition to emailing me at john at realtalkms.com, now john is spelled J-O-N at realtalkms.com, well, now you can also call a special listener hotline that I set up specifically to capture your comments and suggestions. 
Just call area code 310-526-2283 in the United States and share your thoughts. So whether you choose to shoot me an email or make a phone call, I hope you'll get in touch and add your input to our conversation. My name is John Strum. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.